While some issues confronting the LGBT community are gaining acceptance, others continue to spark fierce debate. In particular, the public remains divided over transgender rights issues. According to some estimates, there are just 700,000 transgender adults in the United States, less than 1% of the population. And as transgender men and women push for equal treatment, an unlikely cause celeb has emerged. Michelle Kosalik is serving a life sentence for murder and fighting for taxpayer-funded gender reassignment surgery. Boston Spirit magazine recently conducted a phone interview with Kosalik about that legal battle. In this week's Focus Report, WGBH News reporter Adam Riley shows us the LGBT community is rallying behind the unsympathetic inmate. In a recent interview with Boston Spirit magazine, Michelle Kosalek waxed regretful, not for killing her wife, Cheryl McCall, but for making the lives of other transgender individuals more difficult. My crime has been conflated with my right to medical care. In a very cruel way that I'm sure has negatively impacted uh, the transgender members of the family. But according to Mason Dunn, the head of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition, Kosalek's impact has actually been positive. I think when you have uh, cases like this that set such amazing precedent for having transgender inclusive care, there's very little downside. Dunn believes trans individuals should get all the medical care they need, including gender reassignment surgery. And ultimately, Dunn says, Judge Mark Wolf's ruling that Kosalek has a right to such treatment helps make that case. Thinking about insurance companies and businesses and the state itself. Now we can take this to all of these different institutions and groups and say, here it's medically necessary, you should treat it as such as well. As advocates like Dunn talk about Kosalek, Cheryl McCall's murder barely comes up. Jennifer Levi is representing Kosalek and says that when it comes to treatment, the crime is irrelevant. It's certainly true that people who are incarcerated are often not politically popular or popular in the public sentiment. But that's not what's at the heart of this case. What is, Levi says, is the right to what she calls life-saving medical care, no matter how unsympathetic the prisoner may be. People had a choice. I suppose they would deny people in prison food. People might say that we should um, abuse people who are incarcerated or torture them. But that's not the American way. Still, not everyone thinks Kosalek's rights are so clear-cut. In that Boston Spirit interview, Kosalek referenced negative comments on a transgender website. People were questioning why a prisoner should be allowed to get something. I mean, this is really big in the minds of trans people in the community. Why a prisoner should be able to get a procedure that is very, very expensive that many of them have to save years to be able to afford. Meanwhile, gay-friendly politicians like Deval Patrick and Elizabeth Warren have opposed Kosalek's request for treatment, something Kosalek's advocates downplay. I do still consider many of those people, uh, the governor among them, to be LGBT allies uh, in many cases, but maybe not this case. But Kosalek is less forgiving. We don't go to prison for punishment. We come to prison as punishment. This is what a lot of people, even our elected officials, don't understand. What makes Kosalek's push for treatment uh, fascinating, I think, is that it's both a legal case but also part of a bigger cultural battle that's mm -hmm. going on. And, Emily, my suspicion is that in their heart of hearts, advocates like Mason Dunn and Jennifer Levi would prefer at least a marginally more sympathetic person on whose behalf to be fighting. Because when it comes to selling transgender rights to the public, uh, Michelle Kosalek, I think, is a, a very difficult person with whom to do that. Yeah, why not just admit that up front? Because it sort of puts this person in the spotlight when there's a lot of other dubious issues surrounding this case. It's not it's not clean cut. There could be somebody else that they could rally around. I think it's because they genuinely believe that uh, uh, Michelle Kosalek's, you know, horrible character mm -hmm. doesn't really matter here. This is, as they see it, a life-saving procedure she's trying to get, just like, a you know, a coronary bypass would be, or treatment for cancer. Uh, they think she needs it to stay alive mm -hmm. and that, you know, she shouldn't have to apologize for that. All right, Adam, thanks for that. Well, my next guest is an outspoken activist for gay and transgender rights. Sue O'Connell is co-publisher of Bay Windows, New England's largest newspaper serving the LGBT community. Welcome, Sue. Hey, Emily. How well, are I know you? you'll tell it what <laughs> it is, because you always do. So thanks. is Michelle Kosalik uh, somebody that, that the LGBT community rallies around in, in all sincerity, or not really? They kind of sort of feel like they have to. Some people don't feel like they have to at all. I mean, no, she is uh, absolutely unsympathetic. I think that the portrayal of, uh, in the interview with Spirit Magazine about 
the accidental death of, of her wife. Tragic accidental situation. Which it was not at all. It no. was a vicious murder. Um, makes, makes the case that she is unsympathetic and some people would rather this just go away. But at the same time, um, you know, that's the reason why the uh, statue holding the scales has a blindfold on, because we, we have to treat people based uh, on an equality, not on how we perceive them, but actually how we, we want to be fair in America. The other reality about the law, which I think Adam um, kind of spoke to, is that a lot of law gets made in the mess. You know, a, a lot of the same-sex marriage equality law was mm -hmm. made from divorces, custody cases. Uh, slavery was stopped based on who owned what slave when the slave escaped from a free state to a, or from a, a slave state to a free state. So the messiness of how we get there is, is fairly common, but uh, this uh, is a headline-grabbing type of story. On the other story. hand, the medical community, as you well know, is still very divided over mm -hmm. this as a procedure. Yes, legally... Michelle Kosalik has been granted the right to have the surgery, but some in the medical community, not the team of doctors who, who, who made this decision, think that this is the absolute wrong way to go. Well, and also some people in the transgender community don't look at the surgery as a necessity to their transformation, that they, they can decide mm -hmm. um, when they feel comfortable with their bodies and when they feel that they are the gender that their brain is. So yes, there is definitely some uh, back and forth on this, but I think the point is that we do have a court ruling, we do have doctors that do agree, and again, it brings us down to this horrible issue of how do we treat inmates uh, when they get access to medical procedures that most common people yes. don't. You know, and that's a broader issue. That's <laughs> not is. just about transgender issues. But that's an emotional issue. Because yes. Once you're in prison, you've lost your freedoms. You've lost all your rights, so you're the ward of the state. That's, that's a specious argument. You, they have to pay for you. Mm -hmm. Talk about, though, the bigger issue about transgender and the LGB community. I mean, that the T group is, has not been accepted with all the L and the Bs. That's true. I mean, it's been a big battle. I mean, <laughs> what you're dealing with with transgender folks, too, is a small number of people who are by large the sort of true ident uh, definition of a minority. Many of them have been abandoned by their families. They face greater mental health challenges, greater job challenges, greater abuse challenges. They are by far more often the victim of crimes than they are the perpetrator of crimes, even though they are always portrayed as being these predators. But they're not. They're always the victims for almost 99 percent of the time. And, at the, and as the gay and lesbian civil rights movement went forward, it used to be gay, mm -hmm. and then it became gay and lesbian when folks like Rita Mae Brown fought mm -hmm. for inclusion, and then it became gay, lesbian, and bisexual. And as gay bi and, and lesbians were getting more and more civil rights, there was a fear of including transgender individuals because people normally just don't get it. And it isn't until recently that transgender has actually been added on to names like the Human Rights Campaign, America's largest lobbying group for G G uh, LGBT. Folks, so it's been a battle for them, and they don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't throw big fundraisers like gay men and lesbians can to raise money for advocacy groups. So, in my opinion, it's it's really the next frontier mm -hmm. for civil well, you, rights. You say people don't get it. Well, Michelle Kosalik is a good example because in the the blog that Michelle Kosalik wrote. Talk, she talks about uh, marrying another transgender woman, which is a man that's transgendering to female, the same as Michelle Kosalik is. So the presumption is that as a woman, she'd rather be with a man, but that doesn't Well, sexual to be the orientation case. and gender identity are not the same. You can be two transgender um, male to female and be lesbians. You know, your, your orientation is nowhere near mm -hmm. what your gender expression is. And it's also been sort of ironic that it, some people in the gay and lesbian community have rejected the transgender rights issue. When it, in the early days for gays and lesbians, our gender identity is what we got, tr we got discriminated against, whether mm -hmm. folks perceived us as being too masculine if we were women or too feminine mm -hmm. if we were men. And when you get right down to it, it is sort of the final frontier. Women in the workplace still face that they get accused of being, um, you know, if they're 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 bossy, they're not leaders, you know. So gender identity is where it's all at this, know, this millennium. Apparently, Michelle Kosalik said something about my father being a curmudgeon, <laughs> right? But I'm a curmudgeon too, but not as lovable. And I said, you know why? I'm a woman. That's exactly right, because male entitlement <laughs> does not change just exactly. because you've had transgender uh, surgery. That's for sure. All right, Sue O'Connell, thanks. All right, thanks for your perspective. We asked for your reaction to Boston Spirit Magazine's Michelle Kosalik interview, and as you can imagine, the opinions ran the gamut. Here are just a few. Alex writes, the American Medical Association says gender reassignment surgery is medically necessary. Therefore, there should be no argument here. 
That point was raised last night by Boston Spirit magazine editor James Lopata. If she needed a hip replacement, she would get it. If she needed cancer treatment, she would get it. Why is this transgender issue different? But David takes exception to that, writing, As a gay man with many transgender friends, I still have a hard time with this. I can't see the comparison of having your hip replaced with sexual reassignment. And as you can imagine, some viewers express their strong opposition to gender reassignment altogether. Monica writes, The very idea that a neutered man considers himself a woman is the height of misogyny. The person's entire genetic makeup remains male. He has no internal female reproductive organs. Nothing his body does reflects a woman's body. Whether Michelle Kosalik ultimately undergoes gender reassignment will be decided in the legal system. A federal appeals court will consider the case in May.